So what I'm going to talk about now is message passing concepts. There is a slight overlap in this talk, and not in the actual slides, other than one slide, but in the, 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 the material as to what we may have talked about last week, uh, sorry, Monday, Tuesday on the intro to HPC, but hopefully it's not too much of an overlap. I'm going to talk about the concepts here. So what I'll cover is the message passing model, um, SPMD, single program multiple data, which is a part of the programming model, and I'll explain what that means. I'll talk about communication modes, which is an important concept, and the first exercise is designed, it's not a programming exercise, it's designed to try and make you think about these concepts. And I'll talk a bit about collective communications, and we'll revisit all these in detail when we do the examples, but um, it's important to get the concepts um, in your mind. So, if I was giving a course on programming, okay, imagine you'd never programmed before. Hopefully you have programmed before, otherwise you're in a bit of a shock. But if you'd never programmed before, I was giving, I would, I, if I was talking serial programming as opposed to parallel programming, I would talk about concepts first. I would talk about arrays, control for a subroutines variable. It's human readable code. You have OO and such like. Uh, that's what I would talk about, okay? Then I would say, well, these are generic concepts which cover languages. Then there are, sorry, that, that cover, that, that encapsulate serial programming. Then there are various languages which, which, which implement them. C, C++, Python, Java, Fortran, you have if, then, s, struct, and things like this. That, 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 those are languages which implement these concepts. And then there's a third level, which is, okay, I understand arrays and control flow. I understand uh, Fortran or, or C. On this particular computer, Archer, my laptop, the departmental cluster, how do I compile my code? There are details. You might use Cray, Fortran, GCC, ICC, okay? So there's concepts, languages, and then implementations. Now, in message passing, it's important to differentiate the um, the these three things. So what we're going to talk about first are the concepts, which are things like processes, send, receive, SPMD collectives, and groups. In terms of implementations, again, there are lots of implementations. You have Intel MPI, Cray MPI, Open MPI, MPI CH2. There's lots of implementations, okay. However, the, the good and the bad thing about MPI is there is only one library, right? Rather than there being lots of message passing libraries, like there are lots of programming languages, there is one message passing library. Everyone else has died, okay? Now, that is a good thing, because when you're learning it, it means that you don't have to worry. You just learn MPI, and you can program any supercomputer in the world. They will all run MPI. But it's a mistake to start teaching you MPI. You still have to understand that there are concepts, which are general message passing concepts, that happen to be implemented in MPI. Now, I appreciate there isn't more than one MPI library, but it's still important to make that distinction. For example, MPI isn't magic. It's not perfect. There are things in MPI which are a bit stupid, I think. There are things which are hard. There are things which are more difficult than they need to be, okay? But the concepts are, are more, you know, so, so that's, that is, I still want to maintain these three levels for that reason. So this, this is about prog this is about concepts. So the message passing model is based on the notion of processes. So what we do in message passing, when you write a serial program, you run Internet Explorer or you run you know, any program on your laptop, it becomes a single process. And if you do top on Linux or look at your task manager um, in, in, in Windows, you will see you know, an application or a process running. And a process is an instance of a program together with its data. Okay? So what we do in message passing is we say, well, we're not going to launch one process. We're going to launch lots of processes. Now, of course, your laptop does this all the time. Your laptop's probably running 50 processes at the moment. And we're looking at your email and running Facebook and all kinds of things. But what we are going to do is we're going to get these processes to cooperate. So we're going to run multiple processes. There's nothing special about them. The operating system doesn't know they're special. It just happens to be a lot of them. It's just running these processes. But we are going to make them cooperate. So message passing parallelism is a way of making multiple processes cooperate on the same task. And the important concept is, and this is going to be confusing if you've done OpenMP shared memory programming, each process only has access to its own data. Each process is ring fed from the other ones. Each process is living in its own world. And that's why we need to do something special if we want them to communicate. They can't share data. I had an analogy yesterday where this is like you, you're, in, you're in your office with one blackboard in your so your, your collaborator is in another office with his or her blackboard. You've got different blackboards. The blackboards are in the memory. They're in different offices. You can't 
read or write to your office mate's blackboard, you have to phone them or talk to them. And two processes if they want to share data. Because all data is private, they have to send and receive messages. And these messages we'll see are analogous to sending emails, making phone calls, uh, sending a letter in different circumstances. And the important point is that you could invent a new language, and people love doing this, let's invent a new language, which is a message passing language. But in fact, you know, well, I used to say there's only one new language taken off in the past 20 years, which is Java. It's not true now because Python has come around. But, you know, languages are long lived. People don't like learning new languages. So the only way to really get message passing working in practice is to, is to supply it as a library. So MPI is nothing but a library of function calls, call above from C, C++ Fortran, that allows you to do magic things like send messages between processes. Okay. Python does have quite a nice interface to, to MPI. If anyone's brave, they can try the exercise in Python. Um, but um, I may I may encompass Python in the, cor in the course in the future. I don't know. But um. so the the sequential paradigm. When you write a sequential program, you imagine that your program has. So as I said, when you when you write a sequential program, you launch a process. And in your mind, you think, well, the process has access, exclusive access to the processor, to the processor core, and exclusive access to the memory. Okay? And that's your conceptual model when you write a, no a, a normal program. Of course, nothing could be further from the truth, because you don't have exclusive access to the processor sharing with lots of other stuff. You don't have exclusive access to the memory. There's caches in here. There's all kinds of funny stuff going on. Your program could be swapped out for half an hour and swapped back in again. But that doesn't matter. If you believe that when you write a normal program, that you're writing a program which has exclusive access to the processor and exclusive access to the memory, then you, your program will work, regardless of what actually happens. So the analogy in parallel programming, in MPI programming, is we're going to launch multiple processes, and it will turn out they all have an ID, and in MPI it's quite nice, they're just numbered 0, 1, 2, 3. And there is some physical communications network which mediates the messages. I'm going to send data from process 0 to process 3, OK? Underneath there will be some network. On Archer it will be the Cray network. It could be Wi-Fi, it could be Ethernet, it could be anything. You don't care. The whole point is the MPI interface, the message passing interface, isolates you from that. So you don't have to care about that. All you know is you have a function call or a subroutine call that allows you to send data from one process to another. And beneath, now, for performance, you may care about this, but when you're, you know, that's, that's a later topic. You don't care how it's implemented. So you can run the same MPI program on your laptop as you can run on Archer, okay? You just may have to recompile it slightly differently. So this model, this conceptual model of processes communicating over a network maps very, uh, this is an old picture, but uh, maps very directly to the architectures of large-scale parallel machines. So this is the predecessor to Archer. This is Hector, um, which we had actually had a much nicer picture of Hector than Archer, um, which is why I left it up. But conceptually, you should think of Hector as being a bunch of processors with memory connected by an interconnect. Okay? There's thousands of them, it's similar with Archer. And so this is your conceptual model of how, you, how, you, um, uh, how you're writing a parallel program. Or the other model you could have is all these laptops. All the laptops in this, this room are a parallel computer. What we're going to do is we're going to run lots of programs on each of the laptops, which are very different. Sorry, the laptops are very different, very distinct. And we're going to get them to talk to each other by sending messages. That's, that's your conceptual model. Okay. And people who were here yesterday will have seen this, this um, slide, but I'll go through it again. The way that inter-process communication works is that you're running, a, you're running programs on a program on process one and a program on process two. And if process one wants to send some data to process two, first it initializes it, say I've got some variable A, which is equal to 23, and that initializes the process's data. Now, of course, the, this process's data is completely separate from that process's data. You should think of process one as running on that laptop over there and process two running on that, that laptop over there. They're completely separate machines. One could be in Australia. Okay. So, how do I get this data from there to there? Well, in message passing, so has anyone done shared memory programming, OpenMP at all? A few, a few people, okay. 
Okay, so in, in shared memory programming, you would you would say, well, we've all got access to the shared memory, we'll just read it. You, you can't do that in distributed memory programming. There's no way that that laptop over there can read the memory of that laptop over there. So process one has to do something magic. And what it does is it calls a special function call, and we'll see what these are called in MPI, but generically it's a send routine. It says, I want to send the data A to process two. And this is in some sense like making a phone call, sending an email, writing a letter. So, th so the MPI system sends that data. But of course, the data can't magically appear in process two's memory. Just like when you send an email to somebody, it doesn't magically, the documents up don't magically appear in their, in their folder. The person, the receiver has to participate. The receiver has to actively receive that message. If I send somebody an email, I have not transferred the data until they read the email, okay? If I phone somebody, I haven't achieved anything unless they pick up the phone. So it's important to realize that, that um, inter-process communication and message passing is a two-sided affair where you have active senders but also active receivers. So process two has to actively say, I would like to receive a message from process one and I will put it in my variable B. So then the MPI system, this is like downloading an email, uh, downloading an attachment, will say, okay, now the data goes into process two's memory. And now process two can say, well, A equals B plus one, so A is 24. So the other important point here is both process one and process two, both that laptop over there and lap laptop over there, have a variable called A, but they're different variables, they have different values, okay? So on process one, A is 23, on process two, A is 24. So you cannot ask in a message passing program, what is the value of A? That's a meaningless question. You have to say, what is the value of A on process number 57, okay? Because there's for every process, it has its own A. You also can't ask, uh, what line is my parallel program at? That's meaningless as well, because we'll see later, each process is running the code independently. So they could be at completely different points in the code. They could be at the same point. But a priori, it's a meaningless question to ask, what line of code is my parallel program on? Okay, Because it doesn't make any sense. So that can be a bit confusing. It's particularly confusing because we use the SPMD model. So you can imagine that you could say, right, you know, I've got a situation where, um, where I want to run, I want every process to do different things. So I'll, I'll, I want to run a program on 50 laptops. I'll write 50 programs. So I'll, I'll run program one there, program two there, program three there, program four there, all the way up. Now, clearly that, that would work in practice, but it would work in principle, sorry, but in practice it's just not going to work. If I say, right, you're going to run on 10,000 cores of Hector, or not of Archer, so excuse me, I will... We recently changed from Hector to Archer, so I can't quite get my head around it. Uh, you want to run a program on 10,000 cores on Archer, 10,000 processes, go away and give me 10,000 executables. You're going to say, well, no, sorry, I can't be bothered with that. So what actually happens in most message passing models is you write one piece of source code, a single program. So it's called single program. You write one program, and when you run the program, multiple copies are run. So I would say, please run this program on 50 laptops. And magically, a copy would appear on every laptop and start running. But it is a copy, but it is of the same program. However, it's the same program, but each instance is a copy, an independent copy, so it has its own data. So the model's called SPMD, single program, multiple data. That's why A can have different values, even though you ran the same program. In message passing, you run multiple copies of it, so you have 50 A's, 10,000 A's, and they could all have different values. So you might say, well, if each process is running the same program, why don't they do the same thing? Well, by default, they will do the same thing, unless you'd say otherwise. And the magic thing is every process can ask, ask who they are. Okay, so I alluded to that here. Every process has an, an identifier. Luckily, in MPI, it's a nice number. Well. Lucky, unless you're a Fortran program, and the fact it starts at zero is a bit of a hassle, but everything's a bit of a hassle for Fortran programmers, unfortunately. Um, and you can say, who am I? So basically, although you're running the same program, you can say, who am I? And if you're process three, you can say, ah, if I'm process three, I want to do this. I'm process seven, I'll do something else. So actually running the same program everywhere isn't actually a restriction because you can find out who you are and you can do completely different things based on it. Now, in scientific and technical programming, actually, most programs are actually doing the same thing. If you want to simulate the weather, okay, you run the same program, whether you're simulating the weather over Scotland or England. You have different data, you have different topography, different weather conditions, but you're running the same program. So actually, most, most scientific and technical programs, each process is running the same code, operating on different data. However, they could be running different code. And if you want to do that, 
you can just say, well, imagine I want a model where I have a, a task farm where we have a, a, a controller and workers. So for the sake of argument, I'm the controller and you're the workers. I want to write a controller program where I give you work and I want you to run a worker program where you do work and give it back to me. Well, clearly that's two programs. Well, in SPMD, it's trivial. You just make the programs functions or subroutine calls. So you, everyone runs the same code. But the first thing they do is say, give me this magic number. And if I'm the controller process, let's say we call that process zero, then I call the controller thing, else everyone else calls the worker. So it's, 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 it's not a restriction in practice. If you want to run multiple programs, you just stick them in the same program and make them functions. Though I said in practice, in scientific and technical programming, we rarely do that, because actually most of the time we're doing something where everybody is doing a very similar calculation. Or in Fortran, it's just the same. So I've talked a bit about messages, but not really said what they are. Um, a message transfers a number of data items of a certain type from the memory of one process to the memory of another. So messages are very raw things in MPI. Um, they're like emails used to be. Emails just used to be text. Now they're multimedia attachments, all kinds of rubbish. But really, an MPI message is five integers, seven reals, eight floating point numbers, OK? It is not a structure or an object. That's why MPI really doesn't fit well with object-oriented languages like Java or, or, or to some senses, C++. C, C++ because a, a message is just, as I said, a block of data. That, that's all it is. It's, so it has other information on it. Obviously, like if you send a letter to somebody, the letter is just text. But you have some other information like you know who it's for and such like. So a message will have some kind of header on it say who it's from, where it's going, how many items are out, what they are, the data, maybe some identifier. But, but the actual data packet, the payload, is just raw, raw data. Okay? It's nothing. We can actually construct more complicated types, but it, they're not objects. They're not, they are really just, you should think of a message. Your, your canonical message is 50 integers or something. So, so that's sort of the basic concepts. Generally, in message passing, um, there, are, there are two ways, well, there are many ways, but two fundamental ways you could imagine writing a message passing system, OK? So sending a message can be, can be synchronous or asynchronous, OK? So um, this is a, what I might say a formal definition of when a message passing operation is completed. So as an analogy, if I was important enough to have a secretary, secretary I could say to my secretary, uh, could you please send a letter to Professor Bloggins, OK? So they would come back and say, I have sent the letter to Professor Bloggins. What would they have done at that point? What would I expect them to have done? So I posted it. But has Professor Bloggins got the message yet? No. So if I ask someone to send a letter, that operation has completed at the point the data has been sent away, OK? And that is called asynchronous communication. The asynchronous send completes as soon as the message is gone, OK? However, if I'd asked my secretary, could you go and please phone Professor Bloggins, and they'd come back and said, yes, I have phoned Professor Bloggins, I would assume they'd picked up the phone and actually spoken to him or her, OK? So that's called synchronous communication. A synch synchronous send is only completed, is not completed until the message has started to be received. So these are conceptual things. Are you thinking of sending messages like making a phone call, or are you thinking about them as, as like sending a letter or sending an email? Okay. And in MPI, you have a choice of doing both. And actually, one of the, I'll do a forward look. One of the most confusing things about MPI is that the, the standard send, the most basic MPI send, can be either of these. And that causes endless confusion. But conceptually, you can see that you, it's a decision you make. You know, d d when you send a message, do you want the, me the send to wait until the message has been received, which might go give you a warm, fuzzy feeling that the data has got there. That might be nice to know. But obviously, it's going to be slow because the guy has to wait around. Or do you want it to be like an, e an email? You send it off. So you can get on with your work, but then you're worried, well, I never know when he got it, whether the person got the message. So that is... Um, that's an important distinction, and we'll, we'll explore those two concepts in the course. Receives in MPI, well, in message passing in general, are always synchronous. The receiving process waits until the message arrives. So it's not a very good analogy, because it's a very sad one, which is you're expecting a phone call, so you go and stand by the phone, okay? and you wait for the phone to ring. And in MPI, and in most message passing systems, there are no timeouts. Okay? So if you wait for a message to come in, if you wait for the phone to ring, 
and it doesn't ring, you just stand there forever. And you're, what happens in practice, your program locks up, okay? Things start to go wrong. But there are no timeouts. Now, there are ways of the most, we'll cover this later, more sophisticated ways of saying, you know, has a message arrived? You know, you, like checking your inbox and, and getting on with work if there isn't a message. But by default, the receives are synchronous. You stand there and wait forever. So it's very easy to write MPI programs, which just, it's called deadlock. If, you, if one process is expecting a message and the other process isn't sending it to it, it will just sit there forever and your program probably just seizes up and stops. So that's one of the major problems with, with trying to do message passing programming. So synchronous send is a bit like, I mean, making a phone call is one um, analogy. Another one is sending a fax. Um, now this again, this analogy is sort of broken down a bit now that faxes scan things. But uh, in the old days, when you send a fax, you stood at the fax machine, you put it in, and you waited, and then you got a beep back. And when the fax machine beeped, you know, you knew that the fax had been received at the other side of the world, okay? So it, again, maybe making a phone call is more of a, a a useful analogy now. But um, it's the beep which is very important. That means that you know the message has got there. But of course you have to wait for the beep. So that's a bit of a problem. Asynchronous send is like posting a letter. You only know when the letter has been posted, not when it has been received. So you stick the letter in the mailbox and then you just hope that the, the MPI system or the postman goes and, and delivers it and you unless you unless you've arranged for somebody to send you a message back um, you don't know uh, if and when it is received so the advantage of that is you can go on and get get on with your life um, but the disadvantage potentially is you don't know if it's been received so what I've talked about here are point-to-point -point communications okay Actually, I'm just slightly and normally, normally fairly blasé about the timetable, but um, okay, we're fine. But um, because there are, there's more than one person teaching on this course, I, I have to at least try and hit the brakes. The, what I've talked about so far, point-to-point -point communications, one sender, one receiver, okay? And this is like sending personal emails or, 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 or making phone calls. However, there are... Um, a lot of times when that isn't useful or isn't the most useful uh, thing to do. So for example, I could deliver this lecture through point-to-point -point communications. Every time I wanted to say something, I could walk up to each person in the room and whisper what I wanted to say in their ear and go around, okay? That would work, okay? But it would not be efficient. So there are often communication patterns which aren't point-to-point -point and they're more global, which we want to implement at a higher level. Now these may be built from simple messages under the hood, but conceptually they're higher level. So, collective communications are different from point to point in that they involve more, potentially more than two um, uh, participants. So, you may not think of it as a communication, but global synchronization is, um, there is a way in MPI of saying, look, let's all stop, wait till we get here before we go on. So this is like, we, we all executed a, a barrier before I started lecturing, we all waited till we were all in the room before I lectured, okay? So uh, you can synchronize processes um, with a barrier. Again, maybe make it, taking a note, it's not at all obvious at the moment, but in fact, in MPI, you almost never need barriers um, for correctness. So if you think, oh, I better put a barrier in here to synchronize all my processes to make sure my program works correctly, then either you have an incorrect program or you haven't understood what you're doing. Uh, it's not, that is not immediately obvious, but it's worth thinking about later, that although barriers are there, they can be useful for timing. If you want to time a piece of code, it's nice to get everyone lined up all at the same time and say go. But in terms of correctness, functionality, it is it's almost never required in MPI to have a barrier. So most, if you see a barrier in a code, it's probably not needed, okay? I, mean, I say probably, I mean 99.9% .9 of the time it's not needed. That's where we'll come, come back to that. But that's, well, are you, so another useful is broadcast. That's what I'm doing at the moment. I'm broadcasting. So it's a one to all communication. You have a process that has some data. Maybe it read some data in from disk. You want everyone to know the data, so you broadcast it. So it's important to note that at the moment we are all taking part in the broadcast, okay? We are all executing our broadcast. Within that, we have different functions. 
I have, I am talking and you hopefully might be listening, but the important point is we are all participating in the broadcast. So not everyone has the same role in a collective communication, but everybody has to call it. And the most common mistake people make in MPI is to say, I want to broadcast the data. I'll say, if I'm process zero, call the broadcast. That's not going to work. Everyone has to call the broadcast because that's the only way you can receive the data. Everyone has to participate in the broadcast. So don't put if statements around your collectives unless you know what you're doing, okay? So everyone is participating in the broadcast, but they have different functions within it. So you often do that at the start of a program. One guy reads in some data, eight, this might be the number of iterations or the value of some parameter, and broadcasts it to everybody else. So everybody has the value eight. That's a standard sort of paradigm. Scatter is a bit similar, but you don't copy the data ever, you slice it up. So imagine I was doing a, a simulation of the weather. I might have read in a weather map, and I say, well, I want you to have the, the bottom half of England, you to have the middle bit of England, you to have the top of England. I want to slice the data up. So, so I'm sending data to everybody, but it's a big array. I'm not sending the same data to everybody. I'm slicing up. That's called a scatter. So if I'd read in 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, I might scatter that so that... Um, um, Somebody got naught, someone got one, two, three, four, five. I split the data up. And there are ways of controlling what goes where, but conceptually, it's again, you're sending different data to each receiver. And the reason you do that is you may have read in a big data array and you want to split it up amongst the processes. And we'll do this in the image processing example. You'll read in an image, you'll split it up, and you'll do it by doing a scatter. Gather is the opposite. At the end of the image processing example, we've all processed a subsector of the image. But we want, we want the, the big image at the end. We, so that's a gather. That's where everyone has their own data and somebody gathers it together into a, a big block. Again, everyone takes part in the gather. We all call gather. But within that, we have different roles. Some people are senders and some people are receivers. And that would gather it back together. Reduction operations are probably the most important, the most used. Um, this is where everybody has their own data, but you have one result. So here, we're having a vote on whether we have a strike or not. Um, everyone has their own vote, but there's one result. Or another example is, imagine I wanted to compute the average age of everybody in this room, okay? There is one average age, okay? But you all have your own age. So what I would do there is I'd take all your ages, we would add them all together, and then divide by the number of people, okay? So that would be called a, that's a reduction operation. You're reducing data together, and you can do different things. You might, here you're taking a, um, you might be taking a logical and or a logical or here, or you might be doing a, a sum. Um, but the, the most common thing to do is to do a sum. That is the most common thing to do in message passing programming. Again, a weather forecast, you split, you split up the, the, the country into slices. You say, well, what's the total rainfall across the UK? Well, I know what the rainfall is across the southwest of England. You know what the rainfall is across the top right-hand corner of, of Scotland. Who cares what the, you know, the rainfall over a top rank of Scotland is, we want the only meaningful thing is the global number. So we add them all together to come up with the global number. So the important by reduction operations produce a single result from multiple inputs. So again, a global sum, we have not one, two, three, four, five, and that will give us, if we add them up together, we get oh, 15. Is that right? Yeah. N, N minus one over two. No. Why doesn't that work? Oh, can start at zero. Sorry, okay. N minus, minus two, N minus two, N minus one over two. Okay, so so and, and, and the summation is the most common one. You can you might do a global uh, maximum. You might want to think, well, where's the maximum rainfall in the UK? It's probably Glasgow, but we can we can uh, we can work it out. Um, you might want to do a minimum. Uh, you might want to do. You very rarely do products, to be honest, because. You multiply more than about 10 numbers together and it's going to explode. You often do logical operations, and I'll come back to that. You might have, you know, everyone have ones and zeros, and you might say, you know, does anyone, you know, are, are, are they all zeros? Are they all ones? You might do ands and ors and things like this. So, again, how do we launch a message passing program? Well, to launch a message passing program, we write a single piece of source code with calls to some message passing library, and in this case, MPI. We compile with a standard compiler. That may not be obvious, but we just use our favorite compiler because the compiler knows nothing about message passing. It just got a bunch of subroutines. It doesn't care. Okay? The compiler thinks it's compiling a serial program. In some sense, it is. And you link to a message passing library. You might use one you found on the web. 
You might use one that's supplied by Cray or IBM if you're using a Cray or an IBM machine. Once you've done that, you have a single executable, and then you run multiple copies of the same executable on the parallel machine. Each copy becomes a separate process. Each has its own private data. Each copy can be a completely different line in the program. Yeah, I could say, if I'm process 0, go to line 553. If I'm process 1, call subroutine x. If I'm process 3, call subroutine y. So you can't ask, what is the value of a? You can't ask, what line is my parallel program at? Which does make debugging rather fun. And you do. if I wanted to launch a parallel program across these 30 or 40 laptops, I could log in into each one individually and run the program and log into the next one. We don't do that. We have a launcher program. So what you do is you have a program that says, please run n copies of my executable. And on the Cray, that's called AP Run. More generically, it might be called MPI Run or MPI Exec. But you have a launcher program which, which, which initiates the program. So the issues we'll see, send and receive must match. I've, if you don't, you have deadlock on your program stores forever. As I said, you, um, uh, you, 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 um, there are no timeouts in MPI. Uh, um, it's possible to write very complicated codes. Computer scientists, sorry, I'm not going to slide. Computer scientists will love you to tell you, oh, it's, you know, it's almost impossible to do an automatic analysis of a, of, of a parallel program to check if it will work. But in practice, in scientific and technical programming, there's a limited number of structures that we use. And typically, scientific and technical codes have simple communications patterns. Okay? Typically, they're reasonably easy to implement. And often they, they, they're, they're, they're patterns which have been recognized by the MPI developers. And if you have a pattern you think, if you, if you have some you pattern you think is complicated, look at the manual and it might have been implemented for you. There might be a collective communication to do it. Okay? If you want to transpose a matrix because you're doing a Fourier transform, there is a routine to do that. Okay? And we'll, we'll, we'll maybe look at it later. So summary, messages are the only form of communication. If you don't send messages, you can run a parallel program, but each process will just run independently on its own. Almost all systems use SPMD. All processes run the same code, but they have a unique ID which allows them to take different branches. So SPMD isn't the restriction you might have immediately thought it was. And the basic communications are point to point. We have collective communications that can implement more complicated patterns. You should always use collective communications if you can, because A, they're much simpler, and B, they'll be much faster than what you could write yourself. Second summary message passing is a programming model. As I said, we will be using MPI. We have no choice. There is no other message passing library really around. Other ones like PVM and Parmax and Mako CS tools and things all died, uh, which is good. But it is important to separate those things out. MPI is just a bunch of functional subroutine calls. You need to understand the concepts that you have private variables, explicit communication on this single program multiple data model. And actually, the, the, the issue most people have is understanding the message passing model. It can be a surprisingly different model to message to, to, to serial programming. So I've got a serial program that says, if x is less than 0, print error exit. OK? That seems pretty innocuous. What's the problem with that if that's, if that's a line in a parallel program? So x less than 0 is an error. OK? x should never be less than 0. My x is less than 0, I'm going to give up. OK? What's the problem in parallel? Yeah. So if your x is 7 and mine is minus 3, I stop, but you carry on going. And then five minutes later, you send me a message or expect a message from me. And you don't get it because I've quit. Okay? So it's, it, you know, that's surprisingly hard to cope with in parallel. If, if one process detects a problem, you have to then go away and you have to do a global collective operation. You have to set a flag. You have to all have your own flag, true or false. You have to do a global operation and say, right, did anyone have a problem? If anyone had a problem, we have to stop. So simple things like that can really catch you out.